I am so happy that you chose to join us again. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come now to study your word, asking as always that you would open our hearts and minds to receive you afresh. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are still on article number 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel. Our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin, to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. So we continue with uh, Romans, the seventh chapter, verse 25, which says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And we said that once we have been delivered, uh, we are to be faith talking, faith walking, and faith acting followers of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 1 through, uh, Galatians 3, 11 through 13 says clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. And so we've been looking at a character in the Bible that amazed Jesus with his faith. And the ironic thing is that the person is a centurion and not of the Jewish faith. So we're gonna pick up where we left off last time and uh, we're gonna start out by reading Luke, which is where the story is, Luke the seventh chapter, verses one through 11. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So, Here's the, the situation. Uh, a centurion's servant, whom he valued highly, is sick and about to die. Now, Matthew's gospel tells the same story, but he says that the, Matthew said, tells us that the man is paralyzed and dreadfully tormented. And the centurion heard about Jesus. And we don't know exactly what he heard, but he obviously had heard enough to cause him to have faith that Jesus could heal his servant, even if his servant was at the point of death. And so Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 17, the King James Version says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the centurion heard uh, and, and from his hearing, he received faith. And then he acted on the faith that he received, believing it in his heart that even though his servant was at the point of death, he believed that Jesus could still heal him. So it took faith for this centurion after hearing 
about Jesus. He came up with a plan uh, to get to Jesus for the sake of his servant. And, and so remember we said that, uh, or remember that Jesus is Jewish and this centurion is Roman or Gentile. So what he does in essence is humbly calls in some do bills. Uh, and I say humbly because this man is a leader. His norm is to give commands and expect them to be obeyed. And because he's a centurion and has shown himself to have love for the Jewish people, he had even, I mean, he loved them to the point where he had even built a synagogue in Capernaum. And so it wasn't an odd thing that he had a good relationship with the elders of the Jews. So he sent them to Jesus on his behalf. And two things kind of jump out at me on, uh, um, right here. First is the fact that he sent some elders of the Jews to Jesus on his behalf. You know, that could be a tricky situation because the elders were often the antagonist, they were often antagonists of Jesus. It, it, remember, it was the chief priests and the elders that persuaded the people to ask for Barabbas and crucify Jesus. And, and he's sending the elders to Jesus. So that could be a, a tricky situation. So the centurion had to make his appeal in such a way that the elders would actually go to Jesus for help. Then the other thing that jumped out at me was the fact that they went to Jesus. Actually, and, 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 and they didn't just go, they actually pleaded with him on behalf of the centurion servant. And that caused me to ask myself and ask you, when was the last time we went to Jesus and actually labored in prayer for somebody else? You know, I know we pray for others and, and, and you know, when, when folk are suffering and, and they're having a difficult time, I know we pray for them and we pray sincerely for all of about 20 seconds. You should time your prayer sometimes, not the ones for yourself, because, you know, when it's for ourselves, we, we can stay there. But the prayers that we pray for others, when was the last time we labored in prayer, meaning we intentionally took some time and pleaded with Jesus. We prayed for somebody else like we were praying for ourselves. Praying at his feet, not for me or mine, but for somebody else. The centurion sent some elders of the Jews to Jesus to ask him to come and heal this man's servant. And when they came to Jesus, they put aside any issues that they themselves may have had with Jesus. And the Bible says that they pleaded earnestly with him. That in itself is amazing. Luke gives us details of their plea. They said to Jesus, this man deserves to have you to do this because he loves our nation and he's built our synagogue. They pointed out to Jesus the good that the centurion had done. Now, of course, I don't think that, that that's what persuaded Jesus to go with them, but I think it's a good thing that others can see the good that we have done for other folk and not just for ourselves. Remember when, when Isaiah told Hezekiah in the Old Testament that he was going to die, and, and Hezekiah, turned his face to the wall and prayed earnestly and, and to God. And he pointed out how he had walked with God and how he had walked in truth with a loyal heart. And the Bible says before Isaiah could get to the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him and said, turn around, go back, tell Hezekiah that his prayers have been heard his tears have been seen. He prayed earnestly and God healed him 
And not only did he heal them, he said, I'm going to give you 15 more years. Can you imagine? You never know how when your good deeds might come up before God and cause him to show us or show you some mercy. Not so much because of your deeds, but because he's just merciful like that. It's just good to give God something to work with. It's always better to do good than it is to do evil. Then the Bible says that when Jesus is not far from the centurion's house, the centurion sends some friends to say to Jesus, Lord, don't trouble yourself. Uh, for I, I don't deserve you to come under my roof. He said, that's why I didn't come because I knew how unworthy I was. And he says, but say the word and my servant will be healed. And that's some ma amazing faith in action. He had faith in the word, capital W-O-R-D. John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This man, the centurion, Realize that Jesus is not some ordinary doctor that that has to be present to to you know you got to go to the doctor and he have to see you and and, and then once he sees you and sometimes he have to run tests and and then after he run the test and 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 look at the test then he come up with a plan to heal you but Jesus is so powerful that he can heal a person from miles away just by speaking the word. And this Gentile commander, this Gentile centurion realizes the power of Jesus's word. Think about it. God created the universe with his word. Jesus is literally the word of God. When we study our Bibles, we are studying the actual word of God. And here you have a pagan Gentile that believed that when Jesus, he believed that, that, that Jesus could speak the word and that Jesus was just that powerful when Jesus' own people don't believe. And also this centurion realizes that he is nothing. He, he realizes that even though I may be a, a, a commander, even though I may be over some folk, I'm nothing compared to Jesus. And if you've ever been in the military, like I have, you know that that just don't happen. Commanders always think that they are somebody. But this man says that he doesn't even deserve to have Jesus come to his house or even meet him. That's how humble he is. That's amazing. Who among us would do that? Think, someone you love is sick and about to die. Jesus is coming and is almost there. And you send word for him not to come, but just speak the word. That's amazing. Remember when Lazarus was sick and about to die. Mary and Martha didn't send word for Jesus to speak. They didn't say, uh, go ask Jesus to speak the word and, and heal Lazarus. No, they, they, they sent word and they said, the one you love is sick. In other words, come and come quickly. And remember, they were friends of Jesus. They loved him. He stayed at their house. And yet their faith was not as strong as this centurion. But I get it. More times than not, I'm like Mary and Martha. In my heart of hearts, I want him to come. And I want him to come quickly. You know, are you like me? Sometimes I wish that Jesus could, <coughs> excuse me, would come to me physically and tell me what to do. You know, we give Thomas a bad rap, but I get him. When they told, told Thomas that uh, they had seen the resurrected Jesus, 
Thomas saying in our day, if in our language, Thomas said, yeah, right. I mean, then he got specific. Thomas said, the only way I will believe that a dead man is alive is that I see the nail marks in his hand, feel the scars, and, and, and he said, and I've got to put my hand in his side where he was speared. It's like Thomas is like, no, I saw what happened to Jesus. And if you, if, if I'm going to believe that he is alive, I got to see it. And because of his lack of faith, Thomas had to go a whole week still mourning when he could have been shouting like the rest of the folk. And then when Jesus shows, shows himself to Thomas, then Thomas began to shout a week late. Now he's shouting. But Jesus interrupts Thomas' shout and tells him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I'm often like the father in Mark 9.24. I, I, most of the time I have to say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Y'all, that's something to chew on until next week. Until next time, be blessed, be safe, and come back and join us. Bye-bye.